Welcome back to RX Muscles Iron Road to the Olympia. I'm Dave Palumbo, and I am joined today by someone who has really been taking the bodybuilding world uh, by shock and awe. The man I'm talking about is Samson Dowda. Welcome to the show. Uh, thank you. Thank you for having me on. Really appreciate it. You know, Samson, you know, it's, what's, what's kind of interesting, and I find it funny because, you know, people, they think that, you know, you've made these insane gains this past year, and everyone's talking about, what is Samson doing? He made all these gains. But the truth of the matter is, and I've been following your career for a number of years now, you've been making yeah. gains every single year. And it's yeah. just now they're realizing it because you're so big. But, I mean, right? I mean, how many pounds have you been, you've been gaining on, on average per every, year? Every year, on average, we, we put on 10 pounds without yeah. fail. Easy. Right from when I started bodybuilding every year. So this one was, I mean, probably because it was more in people's sight this time. Right. But we normally put on 10 pounds stage yeah. weight every year. You know, it's funny because when I was coming up too, I, you know, I was adding like a, a lot of weight every year for the first five years yeah. of my career. And I didn't look big until I hit like, you know, that stage weight of about 260. And then people are like, holy, yep. what did this guy do all of a sudden? Well, I've been doing it every year for five years and it just added yep. up to, to what I am now, you know. Yeah, I think because every time we kind of push our off-season weight each year, and for the first time, obviously, getting over 300, 330 pounds is the first time people kind of took, took notice. And people track. lost their yeah. mind when they saw those pictures. <laughs> we can pull them up on your Instagram, uh, Tyler. Yeah. But um, <laughs> they were crazy. I mean, were you were you huffing and puffing, you know? Oh, yeah, this time. The thing is, every time I get to a new off-season weight, the first time we hit it is always uncomfortable. Yeah. We're always huffing up, puffing. I mean, this time, hell, I had to walk around with a walking <laughs> stick. It was so uncomfortable. <laughs> you know, so... We but that, you know, but that's the first time I hit it. And then when I go back to it next year, you yeah. know, I find it a lot easier. I'll take a lot less food. Sure. I'll be a lot more comfortable at that weight. So it always happens the same way each yeah. year. It's like the first time you hit a new weight, it feels like, oh my god, I'm gonna die, <laughs> you know. And then you go back to it and you go, actually, it doesn't feel so bad this time. Right, right. So, I, I know the same thing. Did you? Uh, were you breaking things when you were sitting down on them? That oh. <laughs> yes, I broke a lot of things. Ah, you know, tell, me, I, tell me about I, it. I always I, ask people that are over 300 what they break because I know I used to do this. Oh, right? yeah, you know, you can't, you, people don't understand, like, when you're that weight, you can't just lean on things. You can't just, <laughs> oh, I'm just going to sit down here. I'm just going to, so, you know, my armchair in my living room, I broke that in, like, in a few weeks. And then I got, ordered a new leg and that cracked and, you know, <laughs> lean on the table and it breaks. I almost broke my friend's uh, bathroom sink just by just leaning on just my feet. <laughs> You really have to sort of think before you just put your weight around when you're that size. You know, you're, you know what? I, 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 you bring back memories because I did break things in my friend's house and I felt so bad. I'm like, oh my God. I said, I broke you. I think I broke the handle on your door and I was leaning against it. I didn't realize. And they're like, oh, don't worry about it. You know, but yeah, yeah. Because it's really crazy because even like, you know, you go out and you do walking and you do some design, you have to think really hard before you kind of, you can't just. Bust up and right. go for a run or anything like that because you will end up breaking something. You oh, will end yeah. up falling. Oh, yeah. You really have to sort of consider, okay, right, before I do this thing, I need to really think it through. <laughs> Not just, I can't just up and bounce around like a young guy anymore. Yeah. Like, like, you really got to understand you're carrying a little weight. I had this uh, Pontiac Grand Prix. It was um, it was like oh. a 1986, I think it was, nice. and, or 84. And uh, I was driving it for like 10 years. So I had no money when I first bought a bodybuilding. And when I was yeah. o I was over 300, I was like about 315 at this point. And I went yeah. to get out of the car. And to get out of the car, I used to have to lean against the – I would like like lean back against the seat and like kind of roll myself out of the car. And the oh, yeah. seat snapped because there weren't – the seats today oh. are much better made. But this seat yeah. literally cracked. And basically it was like – it was oh, like yeah. I was – I had to drive like I was lying on a couch because the seat just had no support anymore. It was crazy. Oh, yeah. because my car, because I had a sports car and everything, I couldn't even drive in it off the I sat in it for 20 minutes and the lower back pumps were so insane that I yeah. couldn't sit in it for any longer than 20 minutes. I'm like, yeah, I can't, I can't drive that right now. No, it just doesn't work. Yeah. Yeah. You know? I put uh, Greg Kovacs came to visit me once and he was over 400 pounds and he was, oh, he was in the front of my car and he, he was like, he looked like a like a, like a dwarf in the car. He had his knees against the, the dashboard. He was so big. It was and I was big at the time, but he was so much big. He was like like a hundred pounds bigger than me. And, oh, and, wow. and it just looked insane. And I said, How do you how do you get around? He's like, I got a big truck. I he goes, I can't drive anything else. I don't fit into anything, yep. you know. But I feel like in the States, you guys are more catered for having guys to be big. You have more bigger things and everything yes. else. In the UK, everything is not designed. Oh, yeah. Even the hotel rooms are really small in Europe. Nothing. You know? I mean, you get into the, I mean, I can't even fit in a little shower cubicle they have in hotels <laughs> because it's like, 
you, you're just not going to fit in it. It's not even a case of that, you know. And trying to get on a flight, oh, my God, is the worst thing ever, you know, getting on a plane. Yeah. You kind of walk down the aisle, and every single person looking at you going, please don't sit next yeah. to me. Yeah. Please don't sit next to me. <laughs> just not here, you know. And you get to the one guy and go, oh, that's my seat. And you see their face, just all the feeling yeah. just drops out of their face, and they go, oh, no. You know, back in the day, before they had like a really strict assigned seats, I used to ask people to, you know, if I didn't have the aisle seat, I'm like, you know, I can sit in the window. You're going to be very uncomfortable if I'm sitting there, though. And they used to oh, get because, switch. Yep. Oh, because I know I was flying to Toronto earlier this year and I had a, I booked like the extra leg room and the extra big right. seats and everything else. And I came up and I got there and there was two other guys sitting and sit next to me and oh, I had the one by the window. And as soon as I got there, I physically couldn't actually fit. My legs couldn't fit in between the seats. So I was just like, I can't call the flight. And I was like, look, um, yeah, I can't fit in that seat. And she looked at me and she looked at the seat. She goes, okay, um, our flights are fully booked. Oh, we don't no. have any other seats available. I was like, okay, it looks like I'm going to be standing for the rest of this flight. Oh. And she had to kind of walk up and down the aisle and asking if anybody wants to swap seats with me. Right. And then she put me in an aisle seat. And what happens is you sit in an aisle seat. Half your shoulder is taking up the aisle. Of course, and they so hit you with the car. Walks by. Yep. So every time someone walks by, you gotta lean to one side and lean to one side for eight hours flight, and it was it was horrible. It was you know, oh bad. I you know you bring up a story I forgot. I was on a long flight. It was like an eight hour flight when I was really big. Yeah. And you're right. Your elbow, your shoulder lays into the aisle, and and I fell asleep like this, you know. Oh, and no. this woman must not have been looking, and she hit me with that Ooh. cart so hard. And, you know, oh. I was asleep, so I didn't know what was going on. So I instinctually re just reacted, and, and I kicked my foot forward, and I kicked the cart, and it oh, sent no. the person with the cart, like, halfway down the, the, the aisle. <laughs> I, I felt so bad for the woman because I – but I was I was I was hurt. She literally hurt me because she was like really oh. pushing. And those carts are heavy. They got like forty yeah. thousand oh, yeah. sodas in them. You know. Oh yeah, you know, and they really can do damage. Yeah. You. And you know, yeah. people don't realize like you when you get that big, you don't realize that those things how much they take a toll. I mean, even walking through the airport, you know, everybody's stopping and looking and going, "Oh man, what the hell?" You know, so those things they take a big toll. Like yeah. you don't really think about it at a time because you right. just think, "Okay, I'm just doing bodybuilding. I'm right. getting bigger." And then you realize how much you don't actually fit into the everyday no, life, no, you know. No. But you know, we love the attention, so it's it's all worth yeah, it. But true. now you had a lot of travel issues because I remember these past couple oh, of years, yeah. especially when COVID started, man, it seemed like every place you were going, you never ma you never managed to be able to get there. I felt so bad yeah. for you. How many shows did you get canceled on you at the last oh, minute? Oh man, I think we must have had at least eight of them. Like back, to you back had the after, worst luck you know. of anyone. Oh man, it was because we want we were going to do a show. It was a um, Arnold Brazil in April, so we already started prepping for that. And we were six weeks out from that when the COVID hit, Ugh. and they canceled the show. So we right. just thought, you know what? Well, we're so close. We might as well just carry on prepping. You know, this probably will be over in the next few weeks, and we'll get right. back on it. I'm not knowing at the time, obviously, how bad it was going to be. Right. So every show that kept on coming up, wake up and then going, okay, you know, it's happening with two weeks out. Okay, no, canceled. Okay, next one, six weeks out. Oh, no, canceled. And we carried on all that way, all the way to September. That's crazy. You know, That's so crazy. we stayed on prep for that long. And he was like, oh, man, didn't it, it you, definitely was. Didn't you fly to Japan or something like that? They didn't let you. Uh, South Korea. I flew to South Korea. And that was after literally a weekend after I got, you know, turned away at the airport from going to Tampa for the Tampa Pro. Right. In 2020. You know, so I it was pretty a case of, you know, we were gonna fly out to Tampa and obviously got turned away from the airport and I was just so pissed and so angry and so disappointed. Right. That I just looked on the calendar and go, Okay, what is the next show? And they said, Oh, it was in South Korea in two weeks' time and I was like, Okay, I'm going to that one. Can I fly? And that's when they obviously said, Oh, you gotta quarantine the hotel for two weeks right. if you're gonna be in South Korea. And at the right. time I was like, I probably part of me was just probably just ticked off. I'm like, you know, I'm just yeah. gonna show them anyway. Yeah. So I'm like, I'm just gonna do it. Yeah. But at the time, you know, you, I didn't really know exactly what I was getting myself into. I was kind of like, okay, you know what? It's probably gonna be like a nice hotel. You can walk around the hotel, go to the hotel gym, and all that stuff. I didn't understand the extent of, you know, when they said quarantine, what they really meant was. What, yeah. what was it like? I don't even know what happened. Tell us, man. We so basically, the minute you land in the airport, straight away. They grab you, they pull you to one side, all the people that are coming in. Mm -hmm. They they interview you, interview you for I mean, I was there for four hours after landing. Four hours? Him, yep, Holy mackerel. Same question. Like, oh, do you know the reason you're coming? Why are you stay in here? Oh, oh who God. are you visiting? And it, and you finish the first guy, and then you go to the next guy and he asks the exact same questions. Oh, oh do you know you have to quarantine? Do you know? 
after a while, you almost feel so bad. You just feel like, you know what? Just send me home. <laughs> <laughs> and then when they finish with that, they put you in a bus. Right. And you got these guys with like hazmat suits and everything else. It's like you're, you're in jail there. almost. Yeah. Yeah, really. And they put you on the bus and they take you to this hotel that has half of it has been quarantined just for guys that people are going to be quarantining. Right. There. And you come off and they give you all your toothbrush and little things like that. And then they say, okay, give you a room number. March you to the door of your room. Put you in and lock the door. And just shut the door and Holy pass you for 14 shit. days. And it's literally that. And every morning, uh, they you, they leave your food outside the door. And put, mind you, this isn't your bodybuilding. So this is not bodybuilding food. It's like this kind of stuff you get from the airport, like on an airplane, the little plastic dishes and stuff. So you only got like they three meals out. a day like that? Yep. And that's all you get. Oh, you, like, you were in jail. They leave it outside the door. So because, I mean, I was sort of thinking ahead of it. So we, you know, we packed my bag full of loads of rice and chicken right. and stuff like that I could put in. But... They literally leave it outside your door, and then the tannoy <laughs> goes off once a day going, the food is outside, and then that's it. And it's very, it was definitely an experience, that's for sure. Yeah, talk you know. about finding your inner zen on that trip, my God. Oh, yeah. I mean, being locked in a room for 14 days by yeah. yourself. Yeah. Yeah, it definitely leaves your mind wandering you a bit. You can go a little crazy. Sure. Yeah, exactly. Right? Oh, yeah, definitely. Did I you have internet? Oh, yeah, you had internet everything oh. else. And this is why okay. I was, at least I was able to talk to my family right. and everything else as well, keep yourself busy. And everything else. And because you know you got a show coming up in two weeks, as soon as you get out of the right. room, you're not... Oh, you so you didn't you even... Have, you couldn't even work out. Yeah. You know? No. So you had to solve... That's why I was training in the room, running on a spot for cardio, <laughs> using bands and everything else just to stay in shape. <laughs> so it was definitely like, okay, it was definitely a memorable experience. That's for sure. Yeah. I okay, can imagine. Yeah. So, you know, you, you've been through the ringer uh, over the last two oh, years. Yeah. And it's so and great to finally that. see you break out and, and, and yeah, you know, achieve yeah. what you... That's, we knew you were all capable of, you know? Yeah, you know, and it definitely, I mean, that year it did show, it sort of teach me about the why I can actually undoor and if you really want something bad enough, mm. what extent you can really put yourself to actually go through it. So I said after that year, you know, prepping for a show now, no matter how hard it could be, it can never beat that. At least you know exactly that the show is actually going to happen. Right, exactly. You know? It's got to feel good yet to, to, to know now that when you get on an airplane, you're actually going to show up at the competition <laughs> yeah, and you're going to yeah, be able to yeah, do yeah. it. You, know? yeah. <laughs> you, you do appreciate competing more, though, I probably imagine, oh, because yeah. now you oh, it's like yeah. it was taken away from you for, for a while. You know? For a while. So now you appreciate the idea of, okay, now you the freedom to know that you could just fly to the U.S. and do a yeah. show and fly here and do a show. Right. You do tend to appreciate when you do have that freedom of movement a mm. lot more. Right. Now, you, the last show you competed, you were, what, 280? I was 280 at Arnold Classic earlier this year, yeah. Yeah, I mean, you look great at that show. I mean, uh, oh, I, I mean, you. you really made an impression, I think, on people that you are the real deal and that you're, not only are you, just, are you good, but you're going to be a dangerous guy come Olympia time. Um, oh, how does you. it feel to finally get that validation you've been looking for? I mean, it feels, it feels awesome, you know. Like, for long years, you know, you're sort of waiting for that breakout year and that breakout show, that show you can really sort of put yourself on the map and, you know, that's what the Arnold sort of did for us, you know. He really gave an mm -hmm. opportunity because as soon as you got the invite to do that show, he was, okay, now give it all you got and really, really show what you can do and what you're capable of. So coming out that Arnold and doing that, he really kind of set back that tone, especially standing next to the top five guys in the world and actually mm -hmm. sort of taking stock and actually you then see the point of, okay, how much of a gap are you from them? It gives you a lot to go away to work on, right. you know. And that's what I think the Arnold did for us. He sort of gave us an eye opener and said, okay, right. Okay, you know where you are now. You know how much work you got to do to catch up. Now let's get to work. So that definitely was a year. It was showed I'm really glad that we had the opportunities to do. You know, and, and it's also really validating to know that when you stand up on stage at your height now, no one's saying, well, he needs to be a little bigger, you know. Yeah. You have the size <laughs> yeah. now, you know. Yeah, you know, and that's what I'll say that that having that, especially even checking up on yourself to stand next to guys like Steve, Steve Kuklo and everything else, sure. where he's a really big guy and actually take stock and say, Okay, right. I know that at this stage I shouldn't be chasing the size anymore. Right. Because we do have enough size in it. It's not just the refinement of it. Right. So it does kind of gives you that validation and say, Okay, right, I know what I need to kind of go away and work on. You know, it just happens to be that, you know, Buddy just decides to grow in the off-season. That's what he does. So, mm -hmm. yeah, so we managed to put on more size for that. So what's – now, I know you told me, we talked a little earlier, you said you're not weighing yourself anymore. You don't You don't yeah. even want to look at the scale. I assume you're just going by the mirror in pictures at this point. Yeah, right? because what happens is I know my I know my pitfall. I know my weaknesses. I know when I start a prep, you know, you get a number in your head. Whether you like it or not, you get a number in your head where you mm -hmm. think, oh, roughly, I think I'm going to be on stage about this weight. Right. And what tends to happen when you're really trying to suck down chase conditioning 
when you're close to that number, you tend to start self-sabotaging, whether knowingly or unknowingly. You just because you want to be on stage at that weight you have in the back of your mind. Right. So for me, I know that I'm a I'm a culprit for that of that. You know, I fall for that. So same thing when we did it at Arnold, I didn't check my weight until literally the day of before the show. Wow. Well, I didn't need to know. And we kind of thought, okay, you know what? When I do things like that, where I can now focus on the look and getting tighter, the whole idea of the numbers on the scale doesn't matter anymore. Now it gives me a chance to say, okay, focus on the look and dig deep and really suffer mm. to get in shape. Right. So this time it was does the same thing where as soon as we got to about 10 weeks of art mark, we started doing cardio. I'm just like, okay, numbers don't really matter anymore. And obviously my coach Milos, he wants to know the numbers. He wants to know that. Right. But I saw, right. you know, and he's like, oh, just tell me. I'm like, look, you know, you know how this works for me. You know, <laughs> if I start checking, if I check the weight and it moves, it goes down too fast. I'll get mad because I'm right. losing weight too fast. Right. It's not going down at all. I'll get mad because I feel like I'm not getting in shape quick enough. Right. So either way, it's going to be a, it's so going to be a how out. does Milos make the decision whether he should he up does. your cardio or give you more food or something like that? He goes, he goes by look. He goes by look. Okay, every week we're getting tighter. If he looks, if I'm looking tired mm. and worn out, he goes, he ups my food in that. But right. I think this prep, we haven't had that. So he's really, uh, he's really caused me to suffer. And really <laughs> me down this year. That's so right. even now I'm like, man, dude, I'm, <laughs> it's a struggle. But he keeps saying, well, you don't look catabolic. You don't look any splat for it. So, you know. Yeah, I want you to suffer, suffer. Go on, go on. You know. Look, you know these shows are won and lost on conditioning. You know, at that oh, yeah. level, you have the muscle to stand with anyone in that lineup. Now you have the height and the the structure. So Milos wants you to be shredded. Yeah. is what he wants you to be on stage. Yeah, well. and, and I think that's sort of the mindset coming into this prep was we know it wasn't back in the day where we sort of like reflect on that. Do we have enough muscle? Do we have enough size? Mm -hmm. And you kind of tend to hold on to that because you're wishing that, okay, I hope I have enough muscle. Right. But when you've already sort of got that answer where you know you, you already have enough muscle, yeah. you don't need to worry yeah. about that. You need to be shredded. Good. So, Good point. you know, weight goes out the window now. Okay, yep. get shredded. Until you're shredded, you're not ready. Nothing, forget yep. what a number says. Until yep. you look to the point where you're going, okay, you're inside out shredded, then you're yep. ready. So we just play it by that, this prep. We're just like, look, we're going to suffer each week until we know you can't, there's absolutely nothing left to come off. Right. So that's what we just basically played this year. You made a very, very valid point. And uh, I, don't know if, I don't know if it went past people quickly, but you said something really very insightful. When you're first coming up, a lot of times these judges will tell you, you got to be fuller on stage. But what they really yeah. mean is you need to be bigger. And yeah. if you try to come in fuller, which means less lean, you, yeah. you wind up, then they tell you too soft. So <laughs> yeah. it, yep. it, it's it's this like conundrum. So really what they should just tell you is, you know what, Samson, you look great. Your conditioning was good, but you're just not big enough. You know, yeah. Don't tell yeah. me I need to be fuller because that's implying that I have enough muscle and I'm, I'm not in eating enough. You know, so... Yeah. You put mm -hmm. the muscle on now you need it. Now you still need to come and shred it because if you don't, they're going to tell you you're not lean enough. You're not lean enough. Yeah. Exactly. And, yeah. you know, and there's nothing for athletes sort of coming up. There's nothing worse than having those mixed messages coming in. Right. You know, one minute it's, oh, you're just not full enough. And then you come in the next one looking soft and go, yeah. oh, you're too soft. You need yeah. to come back down. And then you don't understand the real reason is you don't have the size, the density, the thickness yet. Right. You have to sort of come in in a great condition and yeah. But you have to take time to put on that size. Yeah. No one wants to hear that, though, right? No. I mean, the last thing people want to hear is that you, you need more size. They want to think that something must have happened in the prep. Well, no, <laughs> you, you you have what you have to to work with. You know, sometimes you're just not big enough yet. You know, you haven't yeah. arrived. Yeah. You know, and I think you know what for guys come on. I think it's a lot better to hear that. Okay, you know what? You got everything right. It's all there, right. but you just need time. Yeah, but you know, but if you sort of give them McNess and tell them that, um, yeah, you just you, you need to be fuller and everything, they don't associate that with I need more size. Right, they think, right. okay, I just need to eat more next time I'm coming. Yeah, but that's a know. bad message though to give guys like you because you know what? Then you think, well, maybe my coach screwed up and I'm, he's not feeding exactly. me enough. No, he did his job. He's just he can only work with how much muscle I had at the moment. You know, right. exactly, so. exactly that. So you know, now when we solve, you know, this is one thing about taking stocks after you do those shows, mm -hmm. especially when you get to stand with top of guys, you can go back look at the pictures, look at the videos yeah. and see what you're missing compared to them and what's there. And then you can actually go away and say, okay, right, this is what we need to work on. This is what we see and what we need to improve on. And you kind of get, you give yourself your homework yep. when you go away. You know what? Also, I want to give you a compliment because you have a really humble very appreciative um, attitude 
Whereas a lot of – some guys you know, just got this like cocky thing going on where they think, you know, it came too easy to them and they think they got everything coming. You had to like be humble because it, your beginnings were, you know, slow and you weren't getting the placings you really wanted. You never gave up. You had some setbacks with the travel restrictions. And, you know, you never gave up. And so now that you've – it took you the long way to get here, yeah. I think you're much more appreciative of the process. Yeah. And, and I think that that yeah. humbleness comes out in your approach. You know, you, you don't think you're better than anyone. You say, look, right. this is what it took to get here. Here I am, you know. Yeah, and, I, you know, I saw sort of, – you know, at a time, you don't see it. At a time, you're obviously feeling like, oh, why is this happening to me? Why am I not getting right. the place and I want everything? But now looking back at it, I actually I'm glad that it happened that way for me because I'm like – it made me appreciate where I am and how much work I had to do mm. and how much I have to say, okay, right. I wasn't ready then. Right. I just really wasn't ready yet then. So when you look back at it now, you tend to have have a lot more appreciation for the time it takes and know that you can't rush the process. You yep. just can't, yep. you know? So when you stand here now, you're like, well, after going through all that, all that, it makes, it makes you, it really grounds you and makes you realize, okay, mm. Yeah, I had to work a long way to get here, and I understand. For all the guys I've done it, yep. I respect them for that because I knew how much heart it took me. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and I, I mean, I'm sure people have told you. This. I mean, to me, your physique is very reminiscent of like a Tony Freeman physique. You're tall oh, like you. he was. You know, you got the small waist, you got the good sweepy quads, you got the great back and arms and stuff like that. And that oh, I always loved that physique. I thought that that physique is what you know the Mr. Olympia should be all about: tall, broad. But good flow to the body, like a classic physique, but with a lot of muscle. Okay. You know? Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much. Yes, that's you know that's the style for me. That's the look that got me into bodybuilding. You know, mm -hmm. looking at guys like that, like Tony Freeman, Flex Wheeler, and all them. They were the one that drew me into the sport, and I looked at them and go, "Wow, you know, that's yeah. what I would love to look like and achieve one day." So you know, to emulate that now is is just an honor. Right. What would what would make? I mean, obviously, everyone wants to win the show, right? But I mean, what would make yeah. you happy if coming away from the show? What would you like to achieve? What's the goal? Honestly, for me, just cracking top 10 in a lineup this deep, honestly, being in that top 10 for me is, I will walk away thinking, wow, yeah, that's a great achievement, especially in your first year, because as much as it is, you still got to remember, it's just your first year. Right. You don't want to be doing this for a long time. So for me, just cracking top 10, and as well, it would be the first UK guy to crack a top 10 in their pro debut. Or yeah, the Olympia I never thought about that, right? I can walk away with that, my head high, going, you know what, I gave it all I got, and I'm able to crack into that top 10. So well, I, I, think, I think Dorian probably did it too, right? Yeah, yeah. He, he was yeah. second in his debut, yeah. so we he can't was, forget yeah. Dorian, you know? Yeah, we can't forget <laughs> Dorian, yeah. But, <laughs> but yeah, you know, so that definitely, I think, is for me, will keep me happy. Yeah, well, I want to wish you the best of luck. Um, you know, I, I, I love your attitude, I, the the... the Gains and improvements you've made over the last five years have been nothing short of monumental, and uh, um, you should be commended for that. And uh, best of luck at the Olympia. Oh, thank you very much. Really appreciate it. Thank you. All right, guys. And that's going to take us to the end of another RX Muscle Road to the Olympia 2022. I'm Dave Palumbo with Samson Dowder. We'll see you next time. Thank you, guys.